the fabulous 50s came in swinging. The arrival of hotels like the Saxony and the Sans Souci signaled a new standard of glitz and glamour, and another hotel boom was underway. Growing from vacant ocean frontage, this never-ending progress continues to develop into magnificent hotels with complete construction in often less than 100 days. These were the glory days for post-war hotels, like Norman Giller's Caroline, Roy France's Casablanca, and the Algiers, designed by a young New York architect named Morris Lapidus. With every grand hotel that went up, the architects and builders added their own personal signatures to the elegant style of the times. The queen of all beach hotels was the Fountain Blue, a 565-room Miami modern masterpiece built by Ben Novak and designed by Morris Lapidus. Its sleek, curved design put Miami Beach on the map and became a model hotel copied around the world. The Fountain Blue opened its doors December 20th, 1954. I snuck in, to be perfectly candid about it. I snuck into the opening of the Eden Rock and I snuck into the opening of the Fountain Blue. Hotels are exciting places to work on a, any given day, but there are a few hotels that have the magnitude and the excitement and the energy that the Fountain Blue has and had at, since the day it opened its door. The Fountain Blue and other big beach hotels opened their own nightclubs on site, and they booked only the best and brightest stars. Time to explore Miami Beach's exciting nightlife. And what better place to start than the Sherry Frontenac's delightful Pompadour Room? And the Fountain Blue's La Ronda Room were sizzling hot. Every night was standing room only. This was a, the number one showtown in the country. Uh, every hotel had a major nightclub, and every major star came here. Uh, Sinatra, all of them, Martin and Lewis. I mean, it was the place to be. We're in the Deauville's famed Musketeer Room for an evening of dancing. And no matter what your preference, you'll find it here. Continuous music right up till 5 a.m. We can sleep late tomorrow. We used to go to Miami Beach uh, nightclubs and shows all the time. Uh, to see Sammy Davis and Burt Backrack and things like that it was just fabulous. The clubs were hot, and so was Morris Lapidus. Riding high on his Fountain Blue success, Lapidus agreed to design another grand hotel, the Eden Rock. Remember that Lapidus and Novak built the Fountain Blue Hotel together. For the Eden Rock project, Lapidus joined forces with Novak's former partner, Harry Muffson. They put the Eden Rock up right next door. Novak was just beside himself because now you have the Fountain Blue and you have the Eden Rock and now they're competing with one another. Before long, the Fountain Blue built an addition on its property between the two hotels. The huge, rectangular, 1,000-room annex loomed over the Eden Rock's pool deck. It became known far and wide as the Spite Wall. Novak had this wall built. It, it, I mean, it's got rules in it, but none of the windows face north. I mean, it's just a solid wall. And its purpose was to block out the sun from the Eden Rock swimming pool. I don't know what more proof you need that it was done out of spite when you realize that there's only one window and it was Ben Novak's apartment. <laughs> Despite the feud, Morris Lapidus went on to design the Americana Hotel at Bell Harbor, and his fame grew. Back in the day, his designs took major flack from some critics, but Lapidus' Miami modern style, complete with his signature woggles and cheese holes patterns, would define MIMO hotel design and influence generations of architects. Hotel architecture wasn't the only thing constantly evolving on the beach. The hotel vacation experience was also changing. In the late 50s, Miami Beach hotel owner Morris Landsberg introduced the American Plan, a vacation package deal that included room, meals, and entertainment. No one ever thought of setting three meals a day in a hotel. 
Uh, but Morris figured out that if I can keep you captive in the hotel, three meals a day, I got you. In the 60s, Landsberg owned and operated several big beach hotels. His plan allowed guests to have breakfast at one hotel, then dinner and a show at another. His American plan package deal started a trend that's still popular today. In the hotel industry, the highs are always followed by lows, and the 70s were no different. Erosion marred the beauty of Miami Beach, and the Caribbean and other up-and-coming vacation spots took a bite out of the tourism hotels depended on. Some were forced to close. Even the Fountain Blue was in financial trouble. Owner Ben Novak couldn't fill the rooms and declared bankruptcy in December of 77. But a man named Stephen Muss stepped in and saved it. Steve Muss saw an opportunity and he remembered as a kid growing up the Fountain Blue. And he went in and put his money where his mouth was and spent millions in the first three years. Then, in a bold and brilliant move, Muss made the Fountain Blue part of the Hilton Hotels chain in 1978. There wasn't any much in the way of chain hotels in Miami Beach at the time. Muss really did it when he got the Hilton into the Fountain Blue Hotel. Next to Carl Fisher, I think Stephen Muss has done more for Miami Beach than anybody else that I know of. Muss's investment and vibrant ownership in what was now the Fountain Blue Hilton ultimately sparked more growth in the hotel industry. But what even Steve Muss didn't know was that the business was on the brink of another change, this time a rebirth, one that would once again give star billing to Miami Beach. The year was 1976, and on South Beach, a one-woman revolution was brewing by the name of Barbara Capitman. Capitman, a journalist who wrote about design and architecture, came to Miami Beach from New York. When she saw the run-down South Beach district known as God's Waiting Room for all the senior citizens who lived there, she knew she'd found her mission in life. Barbara was a very strong woman. Uh, she took on all of Miami Beach. She took on the Miami Beach hotel owners. She wanted to declare a historic district and don't tear down these hotels because they're too important architecturally. Capitman fell in love with the sublime Art Deco designs of architects like Henry Hohauser and L. Murray Dixon. They'd built the majority of the smaller South Beach hotels. She and designer Leonard Horowitz founded an organization called the Miami Design Preservation League, and they worked to get historic designation for the Art Deco District. The whole county should get together and figure out how to urge the developers to recreate it. Their efforts paid off, and in 1979, it was placed on the National Register of Historic Places, the first 20th century historic district designated in the United States. She was a one-woman show. What she started then started a revolution, which to my way of thinking, saved Miami Beach. It wasn't long after that, another visionary came to town. Tony Goldman was known for restoring and developing properties in New York City. On a trip to Miami, he drove to South Beach, and his life changed forever. I got a chill down my neck. Um, my heart started to beat. Um, my hands got a little sweaty. By the time I got to 6th and 7th Street, with a sign Park Central on the side, and I looked up Ocean Drive, and I said, I've discovered this. This is, this is the American Riviera. Goldman bought the Park Central and 17 more hotels over the next year and a half. Then he threw a spotlight on the Deco District. In the 30s, Carl Fisher put Miami Beach on the map with pictures and postcards of his bathing beauties. In the 80s, Goldman got the world's attention by bringing the fashion photography industry to South Beach. People across the globe picked up their favorite magazines and saw stunning models in the South Beach pastel paradise. Sidewalk cafes bloomed on newly expanded streets and changed the ambiance forever. 
this square mile of, of Art Deco historic architectural district was a one of a kind in the, in the world. And for us, it was an opportunity to be able to preserve it and then reinvent it without destroying it, enhance it. And we were successful in doing that. In 1988, another boost came with a $100 million expansion of the Miami Beach Convention Center. It worked, it clicked. That 100,000 square foot evolved into the million square foot we see today. The auditorium became the Jackie Gleason Theater for the Performing Arts. But the 80s also brought problems and challenges. Condominium growth caused new hotel construction to come to a standstill. The Cuban Mariol boat lift. It is a tide that won't be stemmed daily by the hundreds. A school bus bound for immigrations in Miami filled with refugees. A boat comes in with its human cargo and goes back for another load. Cocaine trafficking. They call them the cocaine cowboys. Yesterday, they struck busy Dadeland shopping mall shortly after two, executing two Latin males in the Crown Liquor Store, hitting two employees and spraying the parking lot with bullets. Cars were riddled with machine gun fire, gas tanks spilling out. And the Liberty City riots brought an increase in crime and bad publicity. Then there was the African-American boycott. South African leader Nelson Mandela came to Miami on a national tour in 1990. But before he got here, he made positive remarks on network TV about Fidel Castro and controversial Mideast leaders. When he arrived in Miami Beach, Jewish and Cuban-American leaders refused to formally greet him. Well, they declined to do that, and that infuriated the black community here. They took it as a personal affront, and I think it, they rightly so objected to it. As a result, they instituted a boycott. Well, who, who paid the price for the boycott? The city of Miami Beach? They paid all right, an estimated $87 million in lost revenue. To help mend relations, the city offered an incentive for the construction of an African-American-owned hotel on the beach. Washington, D.C. developer Don Peebles made the winning bid, and the Royal Palm Hotel opened in 2002. The Royal Palm was, I think, the beginning of ushering in a new time for um, minority ownership in hotels, and the Royal Palm made the statement to the public and to the business community that it could be done. That success was topped off with a bid from the Tisch family to build a new Lowe's Hotel. Jonathan Tisch put together an unforgettable video presentation for the Lowe's bid. We're going to go around town a little bit and talk to some of the people who live in this town, who visit this town, who are tourists here, or who run a business here, to talk about the excitement that's going on here and what the effect of this new hotel would have. Taking a cue from talk show host David Letterman, Jonathan dressed up like a little old lady and asked people on the street what they thought about building a new convention hotel on the beach. Do you think that this area needs more rooms and would create more jobs and some more excitement down here? Yeah, I like it like it is. I like it like this, but if something else is going to add to it, then, you know, if it's done well, if it's done with uh, good planning and it fits in with the Art Deco, then, you know, then it's great. The committee loved his off-the-wall presentation and the plans for the new hotel complex. The Lowe's Hotel opened in 1998. It was the first hotel built on Miami Beach in 31 years. Today, the changes continue. There are condo conversions, boutique hotels, and lots of good old-fashioned renovations and huge expansions, like at the Fountain Blue. At a recent used item sale, locals and visitors lined up around the block to buy a piece of the hotel that has a special place in their hearts. We used to come here when we were kids and spend the weekends here, and it was like the nicest hotel on the beach. So we're gonna miss it. It's a landmark of, of the city, and, and it's, it's really a uh, history for us constantly evolving. 
old treasures are lost while new ones reach for the sky. I, I think that history still has to be written about the hotel industry here because it's going to keep evolving into more than we can even imagine. Miami Beach, a special place in the sun, blessed by nature and reshaped by visionaries. It's a world-class vacation destination, always looking proudly to its past as it pushes forward into the future. Miami Beach is a place where bathing beauties actually take to the water with beautiful streamlining results.